It is a great pleasure to welcome you all to the third annual Global Human Rights Symposium. The Human Rights Fellowship emerges from a broader human rights initiative at Gallatin, attempting to link human rights practice with academic work in human rights. Hi everyone, my name is Cheryl D'Souza and I'm currently a senior in Steinhardt pursuing a degree in public health with a focus in social and public policy. This summer, I worked with the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission right here in New York City, so I did not travel very much. I apologize in advance for the lack of pictures. I worked in the financial district and I didn't think pictures of Fulton Street would be very engaging, <laughs> so I skipped out on those. Um, my official title with the organization was communications intern, but my work was definitely not just focused in communications. I did a lot of things. That was just the one title they thought encapsulated what I did. Um, for two very exciting days, I ran the website, um, the global international website, and it was the most horrifying two days of my life. I had constant nightmares that I was just misspelling everything, and but I did not, so that was great. So a little bit about the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission, or as we fondly call them, Eagle Herc. They are a leading international human rights advocation um, who focus on discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and anything that really centers around that. They, like many organizations, act as a watchdog service. Um, they do a lot of documentation and they do a lot of advocacy. With them, um, what I was doing mainly was doing media monitoring for the region of Asia, a region I deeply sympathize with because I'm from Malaysia. and. It's just, it's interesting to be away from the region and looking into the region from the outside perspective. Um, I also worked on a domestic violence against lesbian, uh, bisexual, and transgender women with them. It was a research project that covered five different countries and will be officially launched in 2014. So I did a lot of transcribing for them, a lot of interviews, and that was really, really interesting. One of the countries actually was Malaysia, which is where I'm from, and so that was deeply, deeply personal to me. To give you an idea of the landscape of Asia in terms of LGBTQ, these are recent headlines. Um, and the good news is it's not all bad. Uh, <laughs> there's just, there've been a lot of advances in recent times. Vietnam is on track to become the first Southeast Asian country to probably legalize same-sex marriage, which is huge, it's huge for the region. Um, pa uh, Philippines, sorry. Philippines military and police force just underwent sensitivity training, which five years ago, this would be unheard of. Malaysia still refuses to acknowledge that this is a thing that should happen. So it's, it's getting better. The interesting thing about staying here, I guess, is that I wasn't really learning about a new culture per se. I was looking into other people's culture from a very outside perspective. And so it allowed a lot of time for sort of self-reflection and thinking, a lot of deep things. Um, Lessons learned. I learned how to organize a charity event. I was given a week to organize a golfing tournament for 48 lesbians in Long Island. And it, was, it was stressful and it was wonderful and there are so many golfing terms I never knew existed and now I am very well informed. Mulligans are important. I did not know this before. Um, and the, it, it's funny, it sounds funny, but it was actually a really, really good training, I guess, on how to hit the ground running with an event because they gave me the bare basics and they said, okay, make it happen. And I said, they're going, what? I, oh, okay. Um, that was fun. Language. I think when I say language, Eagle Herc has a very unique position in that it focuses really on collaboration. And that's not always the case in the NGO world. In the NGO world, money is very important. Grants are very important. And there's always a sense of competition. Whose name goes on what project? Who's leading what investigation? Who's getting the money? Who's getting most of the money? And Eagle Herc really tries to refrain from getting into that politics, which I think is interesting. Um, so they focus a lot on how they present themselves, how they word themselves. and. I think more than any organization I've worked at, they dedicate a lot of time to this. So a lot of times my boss and I would sit down and we would re-review things before we put them out. We'd say, well, what does this say? What does this sound like to you? How do you feel about this? Do you feel like we're coming on too strong? And so one example of that was when there was a spree of hate crimes in the region of Africa that we were responding to. And instead of using the word condemn, we said strongly disapprove and I was sort of at a loss. I was like, but no, we condemn this, right? Like that's how we should, we should all condemn this. Um, and my boss was explaining, well, situationally, if you say you condemn something, you're placing yourself 
in direct opposition and you're not allowing discussion to happen because you're not leaving room for discussion. But when you say strongly disapprove, <laughs> The language itself creates a space, and I thought that was really, really interesting. I think that was probably one of the most valuable lessons I learned from that. Um, diplomacy. So what happened is when something would happen in a different country, we wouldn't respond immediately. We'd reach out to partner organizations, we'd reach out to our agents on the ground, we'd wait sometimes a whole day. And I was really impressed by the patience that was displayed in that because it takes a lot to sort of stand back and say, no, I'm not going to do anything right now. And that's not something a lot of other organizations do, I think. More lessons. Equality does not have any one definition. And I think, you know, we, the other fellows and I in class, we would talk about this all the time, like what really is equality? I still don't have an answer. I don't think there is one concrete thing that's, that is equality, which is why this is so confusing sometimes. And we talk to different people, we conduct interviews, and we say, you know, what is fairness to you? What is equality? What is your equality? And their answers were so different from each other, even coming from the same region. And that was really, really interesting. Um, again, there's a lot, a lot of time for self-reflection. So I hit a slump where I wasn't really sure what I was doing or if what I was doing mattered. And I think you all do that. Like if you're actually engaging with the service you're doing, you hit that point where you're like, well, what am I doing? Why am I doing? Should I still keep doing this? Um, and that's when I had to sit down with my boss and sort of discuss like, what is an accomplishment? Is an accomplishment putting out a newsletter that just informs people? Is an accomplishment passing policy? Is an accomplishment enforcing the policy? Um, and again, I think it depends. It depends where you are and it depends on the region and it depends on the politics of the region. And so it's knowing that accomplishments change and it's okay to sort of roll with that. Um, Urgency, how do you prioritize? Sometimes we'd spend days working on a project and then something would happen and we'd drop it all immediately just to focus on that. And so sometimes things got pushed on the back burner, not because they weren't important, but because they weren't as important. And so relevancy became huge where we were. Um, it was an interesting summer for the LGBTQ movement with DOMA and Prop 8. And so when that happened, there was a two week silence period on the domestic violence project because we just had to focus on that. Like that made more sense. It was the most relevant. It affected a lot of different countries directly and indirectly. And so I sort of learned to roll with that. Questions, these were questions I had for myself. Some of them I've answered, some of them I haven't. I think it's a process. Am I doing enough? I asked myself that a lot just because I think we set ourselves very tangible markers, and I wasn't necessarily checking everything off the list, and that got me really worried. Um, why am I doing this? It, that really ties into the third question, what does it really mean to be an ally? I was the token straight um, intern in the organization, and it became a joke at first. It was sort of a joke, like, yes, the token straight person. But a lot of people were actively questioning me about it to the point where I was questioning myself about it because it never struck me as being strange that I would go and work with this organization. Um, and so that led to a lot of interesting conversations about why it is natural slash not natural for me to be involved with this organization. Does it ever actually get better? Um, like I was mentioning, there was a spate where there was just hate crime after hate crime in the region of Africa. We lost seven, maybe eight activists in one night, and that was really that hit the organization really, really hard. And it was hard at that time to sort of keep your spirits up and say, well, we're doing something meaningful. It does get better, as proven by Vietnam and Philippines, and it's a process and it's a timeline, and it's knowing that it might not happen in the next five years, but maybe in the next 10 years or the next 15. Just very briefly, why international human rights is complicated. Coming to a con uh, an agreement on what constitutes human rights in the first place. It's not, it's not something that's easy to say like, yes, this is a right you absolutely need it. If you don't have it, you will die. And it was interesting to talk to different governmental agencies and them saying, well, no, if you ch like choosing to love someone is a choice, not a right. That is a choice you have made. And so that was an argument we had a lot. Um, intersectionality of rights and culture. I don't know if there's ever one right answer to this question, when it's rights and when it's culture, who wins, what wins, especially in Asia where culture is so pervasive in anything and everything around you, that really becomes quite a question. Um, also in reading articles on Asia, the constant threat of Western values, that was, that was the framework that was used a lot. And growing up in Malaysia, I saw that a lot. So it was interesting to be on the other side looking at and being like, well, 
What's next for me? Um, I'm still mildly involved with the organization. I, from time to time, do transcribing and research for them. Um, the project will be launched in 2014, the Domestic Violence Against Women project. I'm really excited for that. I've sort of switched up my interests a little bit. I'm going down the policy route, which was not something I'd initially been doing. Um, and I'm thinking about getting a job in the policy sector. We'll see. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much.